So it was the year 1994. I know none of you want to know what grade I was in or how old I was, so I won't tell you. It was the year 1994. President Bill Clinton had just taken office. Him and his wife Hillary, they were at the helm of the White House and the government of the United States. Earlier that year, in his, the very beginning of his presidency, the Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, had come to the United States for a papal visit for um, World Youth Day. The World Youth Day that was being celebrated that year in Denver. And part of that visit was a very deliberate visit from the Holy Father to, um, to the Clintons. In that visit, he made a very strong, a very strenuous appeal to them about the need, the, imp- the, the imperative of protecting life and the unborn. His words fell on very deaf ears. It didn't really have the effect that, that anybody in the church would hope for. Since almost immediately they set about to revolutionize and expand abortion rights, and this prompted anxieties over the prospect of taxpayer-funded abortion sparking the Coates Amendment and the U.S. House of Representatives, which sought to you know, strip abortion funding from the plan. Anyway, the world at this time was, was, was watching the United States, and one of those keen observers was a little Albanian nun who had set up shop, had planted her heart and her feet and her hands in the soil of Calcutta, India. I'm talking about, of course, Mother Teresa, right? Mother Teresa, who just like the Holy Father, she came to the United States and she came uh, in the early years of the Clinton administration to speak to the Clintons. The occasion was the uh, National Prayer Breakfast, the National Prayer Breakfast which was that huge ecumenical gathering in Washington, and she was invited, get this, she was invited by Bill Clinton himself. Seems a bit bold, if you ask me. He invited Mother Teresa to speak at the National Prayer Breakfast that year. So, as she took the stage, she shuffled out from behind the curtain, and she ascended the podium, the little step stool there, all five feet of her, her in her beautiful white and blue sari. She was wearing little socks and sandals. Uh, She didn't look like the typical speaker at the National Prayer Breakfast, and she began first by talking about Jesus and John the Baptist in the wombs of their mothers, right? The first national pro, uh, the first pro-life rally that happens there, the mystery of the visitation, and how the unborn John in the womb of Elizabeth leaps for joy at the presence of the unborn Christ. She talks about the beauty of the unborn recognizing the presence of Christ there. Next, she then spoke about love, and then she spoke about selfishness and how out of a lack of love, out of an uh, abundance of selfishness for the unborn, abortion is possible. And then she said this, and I quote, By abortion, the mother does not learn to love, but kills even her own child to solve her problems. Abortion is really a war against the child. And I hate the killing of the innocent child, murder by the mother herself. And if we accept that the mother can kill even her own child, how can we tell other people not to kill one another? Any country that accepts abortion is not teaching its people to love one another, but to use violence to get what they want. This is why the greatest destroyer of love and peace is abortion room was silent for a long time. And then slowly applause began and a standing ovation began and the room was filled for several minutes to a standing ovation. A certain president and the first lady did not stand and did not applaud. Friends, I so wish in some ways that we still had Mother Teresa with us right now in this very dire hour in which we're living in our history of our country right now, this very dire situation in which that old biblical ancient world demon of Moloch, right, the demon who received child sacrifice is kind of spreading his jaws before our nation, before our state to receive so many of our nation's children through abortion. The reality though is this, that we don't have Mother Teresa alive in the flesh walking this soil of the earth with us right now. She was not called upon by the Lord to live in our day, right? We are the ones that the Lord has called into being to be alive today. In those words of Esther, right, we were born for such a time as this. 
This is our moment in many ways. Over and over and over again in the Old Testament, you hear God condemning child sacrifice, right? Which was practiced all throughout the ancient pagan world. It was a temptation to which Israel was always kind of being lured into somehow. Again, this God Moloch accepting child sacrifice. Moloch's priests are still very much alive and well, except they wear white coats and scrubs these days, and they mostly work for Planned Parenthood, which is, as many, many of you probably know, which was founded by Margaret Sanger, who was a eugenicist, who desperately wanted to eliminate the African-American population. So this coming November, this coming November, November 7th, we have here in Ohio an opportunity to send this demonic proposed amendment back to hell from which it came. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, about the proposed constitutional amendment that's going to be on the ballot, the so-called right to reproductive freedom with protections for health and safety. There is nothing about this that is compassionate. There's nothing about it that is helpful or true. Nothing. It has nothing to do with reproduction. It has nothing to do with it. What it's trying to do is to expand and enshrine the so-called right, right, of mothers and fathers to kill their unborn babies. It enshrines and ensures the ability of minors to pursue these sort of experimental, experimental medical procedures whereby they mutilate their own bodies in this attempt to become a member, a member of the opposite sex in so-called affirmative care therapy, right? A mutilation of their body, an attack on their reproductive organs for minors, right? It has nothing to do with health or safety, but everything to do with ideology and advancing, advancing the culture of death, which is built upon this idea that the happy life is the life of self-expression, of autonomy, that I'm unencumbered, unencumbered, unhindered by anything that would constrain my freedom. Here's the point. There is no way that any Catholic in good conscience can support this amendment. It's not possible. It is not, nor is it ever loving or compassionate to make it easier for people to do evil, either to themselves or to other people. That can never be the Catholic mind. That is not compassion. It is not love. I'll put it this way. Simply put, it is always and everywhere wrong for bigger and stronger people to deliberately attack and intentionally target and murder littler, weaker people. It's always wrong for big, strong people to intentionally attack and murder weak, little people. That's what abortion is. It's the attack of the bigger upon the weaker. Like I said, people, persons, persons, that's who's at stake here. Where do persons begin? In mothers. Where do human rights begin? In the womb. Where does, where does a woman's, if women have rights, when does a woman come into being? If not at the moment of conception. This is what we're talking about. Your size as a person doesn't affect your status as a person. Neither does your location as a person affect your status as a person. Nor does your level of dependency as a person affect your status as a person. Nor does your level of consciousness, nor does whether you were a wanted person or an unwanted person, whether you were the result of a violent act of rape or incest or a loving embrace of mother and father, none of these things touch the status of personhood. No person is dispensable. No person is disposable. Pope Francis has called our modern age a throwaway culture. Nowhere do we see that more in this issue of life. So friends, I want to just invite us on this feast day of Mother Teresa to call upon this amazing apostle of the person. Every person that Mother Teresa took care of was a person that society wanted to throw away. Every person that she spent time with and served and cleaned out wounds and sat with until the moment that they died 
she revealed the dignity, the inestimable, infinite dignity and value of every person. And the reason she did it was because she was responding to Jesus, who in Matthew 25 says that we will be judged in the final analysis on what we did or did not do to the weakest, most vulnerable, most fragile, most helpless, most dependent, most voiceless of persons. It came down to five words for Mother Teresa. You did it to me. That was it. Friends, let us call upon Mother Teresa that all consciences of all voters, especially Catholics and Christians, would be illuminated to see, to see this truth and to act on it. Amen.